in public exposure as we continue on with our investigation of the mortgage foreclosure crisis. We are talking with Michael Young, who is a futures trader and broker and who's had a bad week <laughs> because you traded through MF Global. MF Global. Uh, one of the things we were talking about in the other segment we just were getting into was the CFTC. What does that stand for? It's the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, and Congress granted that agency the power to create regulations and oversight for everything that happens in our industry. So they're supposed to watch what happens on the exchanges. They're supposed to watch what happens to what's called futures commission merchants. And they have a huge responsibility. And apparently, uh, in this case, uh, they, their auditing wasn't very valid or they were told about a problem and did nothing. The problem I see is that the chairman of the commission right now, Mr. Gensler, uh, has some serious conflicts of interest with what happened and probably either should resign or recuse himself um, uh, in dealing with the MF Global situation. What conflicts? Well, the problem Mr. Gensler has is that um, he worked for John Corzine and with John Corzine at Goldman Sachs. He worked for Senator John Corzine as a staff aide when John Corzine was in the United States Senate on the Senate Finance Committee. And... Uh, he gave $10,000 to the Corzine cause by donating it to the New Jersey Democratic Party when John was running for re-election back in 2008, I believe. Mm -hmm. So these are fairly recent developments of, of their personal relationship. It just seems really highly inappropriate. And then we found out during the week that Gensler had had conversations with Corzine over these risk instruments that he had at his firm. And one begins to wonder if the personal relationship may be weighed you know, in his mind, well, maybe John knows what he's doing. I really shouldn't insist that he stop doing this. These are the kind of personal questions that only Gensler can answer, but certainly raise significant questions over whether he was impacted by his relationship with John Corzine. But now, uh, Gensler is an employee of the federal government. Well, he's actually chairman of an independent agency. That the, well, the, and, the, and the website is cftc.gov. I mean, the, the .gov part right, is kind of special. It's, it's part of the federal government. It's an independent agency like the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, I like see. those sort of things. Yeah, it charged with, regul with regulating uh, people who are dealing in, in here yeah. in and commodity futures. And implementing Dodd-Frank. One of the biggest things for uh -huh. the commission right now is what should be the position limits. Uh -huh. and this is another huge conflict that, that Chairman Gensler has. His relationships with people that he knew in the New York banking system when he worked for Goldman Sachs have been accumulating huge positions in silver. I mean, absolutely above average positions in the silver futures. And Gensler has not done anything since he's been at the CFTC. So I'm beginning to wonder, is Chairman Gensler too close to the industry that he used, that he used to be in to regulate appropriately? Well, you know, forgive me, but as I as we sit here on public exposure and are talking about the mortgage foreclosure crisis, the the words Goldman Sachs keeps coming back uh, back up almost in every single show. Yes, I, I would say that they may be the robber barons of our era. Well, that's an awful lot to say uh, about an entity that wields so much power. I mean, you you look at just about every major bank here in the, in the United States, and there's a Goldman Sachs person. Well, let me let somehow me give involved. you an example of how of, of the kind of business this firm has been known to do. During the mortgage banking crisis, they sold um, what are what were the basically called reverse repos, which were sophisticated mortgage instruments to AIG as an investment. Okay. Okay. The minute they sold those investments, they knew that those investments would go down because at the same time they sold short the exact investment that they had just sold to their client AIG. Then, when AIG's investment in the repos went bust, the federal government had to step in, the Federal Reserve stepped in and gave $4.8 billion to AIG to bail them out of the repos that Goldman Sachs had given them at 100 cents on the dollar. So $4.8 billion was transferred by the Fed to bail out AIG, which then was transferred to settle the, the Goldman trade that, that AIG owed to Goldman from the repos, and then Goldman magically that December paid its bonuses to its partners of $4.8 billion. Now, where do you suppose that money came from? Well, you know, as a taxpayer, I can, I literally, I can see bailing out a car company because uh, they make things. They employ a lot of people. I have a hard time seeing bailing out somebody that transfers paper around and then pays bonuses for doing it. Well, not just bonuses, Stan, but these are rates of return, uh, I mean, rates of pay and bonuses that are unheard of in American history. 
I mean, we're not talking about that you put in a, a hard day's work at the office and you're CEO of a company and therefore you get a 5% or 10% bonus. We're talking about these guys accumulating 300 million, 400 million, 600 million, 700 million dollars in one year. And I'm going, you know, I could work a very long time. I could make a lot of good trades in my personal account and I could do pretty well, but I would never approach these levels. And the sad thing is, had the Fed not intervened and given AIG the money to bail them out, the people at Goldman Sachs would have been out of business. They would have failed. They wouldn't have been able to pay their bills or, or continue on a business. So what, the, what in essence is the Fed has said, I'm willing to let these people continue on a business. But apparently the Federal Reserve said this week to Pacific Futures Trading Company in Seattle, we don't care about you. You can go ahead and fail. My mind. Um, okay, so we've talked about the Fed. We've talked a little bit about the, the CFTC. Where is the government in all of this? I mean, isn't their job to keep this incredible unfairness from happening? Yeah. <laughs> the government has, the government has, we spend a lot of money on regulation. We don't need more regulations. We need people to enforce the regulations that we have. And we need people in the, that regulate our banks uh, to honestly regulate those banks. But the bigger issue was the mistakes made during the Clinton era by letting national banking come into existence, by taking out Glass-Steagall, which separated the line between investment, take, investment banking, which is risk-taking, and commercial banking, which is commercial lending for businesses. I mean, I'm convinced that if we broke up the national banks, the Citicorps, the Chase Manhattans, the J.P. Morgans, all those people, if they were broken up and made to go back to regional banking, that our economy would prosper again. There would be banks in Seattle that want to lend to businesses that operate in Seattle. And right now, that doesn't occur because all the money goes to New York. Well, right here in Seattle, where where we sit, we're we're close to a to a Chase Bank, and and Chase gobbled up WAMU, purchased right, exactly. WAMU exactly. for whatever whatever the appropriate word is. They they own WAMU. Actually, they received a federal subsidy. Actually, it wasn't a subsidy; it was a gift from the Federal Reserve Bank to buy WAMU at next to nothing, thereby robbing the shareholders of their assets and giving it to the Chase Manhattan Corporation for next to nothing. Why did that happen? That's a question you need to ask Ben Bernanke at the Federal Reserve about why he let this bank, one of the biggest banks in the country that was headquartered in Seattle, by the way, not a New York bank for some reason, you know, and 3,600 high-paying, valuable jobs were lost in our region. Now, the direct impact of this policy, of these policy decisions by Mr. Bernanke was the guy that I buy my sandwiches from down the street, his business suffered. In fact, he had to sell his sandwich shop because the people who worked at Washington Mutual across the street weren't there to buy sandwiches from him anymore. Hmm. We're going to continue along with this line of questioning after a break, but this time we're going to continue it in Europe. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Michael Young, who is a futures commodity and uh, trader and broker, and we'll be back. Be sure to watch segments one and two because segment three is going to be very, very interesting.